Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to all our Guru Maharajas. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your kind association or every time consistently, Maharaj, and welcome on this auspicious day of Ram Navami. If you could kindly speak a few words on glories of Sri Ramachandra, we will be very, very grateful. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, you're muted. Om Gyan Chandrandas Yagina Jana Salakaya Saktu Nirita Mena Tasai Shri Guru Vena Maha Maung Vishnu Padai Krishna Tasai Bhutalai Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Odavani Pachari De Nirvase Sasunya Lari Pasyat Yare Sari Next Pachikopataru this Jaki Pasindu Beva Japitanam Savane Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Mahumamaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. <clears throat> Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <clears throat> Rama, Hare Murti, Sukala, Niyamena, Tishtan, Nana, Vataram, Akarobu, Venetu, Kinchu, Krishna, Swayam, Samabhavat, Paraman, Paman, Yeho, Ovinda, Mari, Burujam, Amaham, Vajami, and this verse from the Brahma Samhita mentions that there are many manifestations or incarnations of the Lord's appearance. And Sri Ram is mentioned first, Ramadi. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is understood that he is the principal incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And we see, we celebrate his uh, appearance every year uh, at this time. Um, in fact, the Ramayana, or the story of the life, or the history of the life of uh, the Supreme Lord's activities in this material world are known throughout the Asian world in different names. And it's quite a popular epic, you might say, for some countries. Others take it more seriously. But uh, it's interesting that outside of the area of Bhart Bhumi, Ram is very much known and also praised and eulogized. So many essential principles, both of the Lord's nature and moral, religious, aesthetic, spiritual values are illustrated throughout the entire Ramayana. The Ramayan teaches how a person who takes the position of the executive head should conduct themselves both in his personal life and in his private life. Uh, and so you'll see the Lord teaches when he comes, not only does he just enact his pastimes, for his transcendental pleasure or for the benefit of the other others. We hear often the verse quoted in the Bhagavad Gita, Yada Yada Hidharmasya Dvanir Bhavati Bharata Bhutanam Dharmasya Yadatanham Sarjami Aham Pravitranayam Sarunam Vinasanaya Chadutskritam Dharma Sam Starpanataya Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. So this uh, in verse illustrates that the Lord comes whenever there is a significant decline in religious principles, a significant rise of religious persons on the planet. We know them as Buddha. And uh, also he comes to protect, enliven his devotees, to give them a chance to see him, serve him, and make 
put their brothers back on the wagon. This is mentioned in the Gita many, many times. So this particular manifestation of incarnation is interesting because he is called Mar Mariana Purusha, or that personality who is exemplary in all of his activities. He follows rules and regulations. You see in the incarnations of some of the other manifestations of the appearances of the Lord, they go outside of civility, morality, aesthetic values. But that's okay because these things are for human life and for people who are inhabitants of the material world, not for the Lord. The Lord can, the Lord makes the principles and he can also change the principles as he suits him in order for a higher good. He doesn't do it simply because he has that power. He does it for a higher good. The Lord is always good. He works for the benefit of everyone. And he knows how to do things for the benefit of everyone, not just for a limited class of people, or even just for the human society. He benefits all of the things. Um, the story of the lion is quite long. It would take hours to narrate an entire story, and there's many authorized versions of the lion. Valmiki is considered to be the most authorized author of the lion. Valmiki was a hunter. A murderer, actually. And he got the association of Narada Muni. He changed, became a great devotee, and by the arrangement of Lord Brahma, he was asked to uh, write the story of the history of the Ramayana. Of course, in those days, there weren't any books. That was two million years ago. But it was done through oral expression and oral reception. <laughs> um, in those days, people had great good memories. So if oral were given to competent persons, they could recite it verbatim at any time. And so this is how the tradition was handed down. Only when Vyasadeva came a little more than 5,000 years ago that he actually put all of this in book form. Um, Dasarat, King Dasarat was the king of Ayodhya. And he had, it says he had 350 wives, and three of them were prominent or chief wives. Uh, we don't hear about that statement so often, but it is mentioned in certain areas of the Ramayan. There are many versions of the Ramayan, and there's many uh, details that are not given in every version. So if you really have to study all of the different authorized versions, you have uh, Valmiki's Ramayan, which is the most authorized. You have Kumbi. Kumbi from the Sri Sampradaya, his, uh, his Ramayana is authorized and it was declared by the Lord himself. And then you have uh, Tulsi, Tulsi Das's Ramayana, which is a beautiful expression of poetic alliteration and glorification of the Lord, but it's tinged with Mayavad philosophy. And therefore, pa Prabhupada uh, cautioned us not to delve into Tulsi Das's Ramayana. Although parts of it are so beautiful, especially the wedding of Sita and Ram, it's so nicely expressed, pure poetry. But on the whole, uh, some of, not on the whole, but some of the parts of the Ramayana indicate certain mind-body principles. <clears throat> uh, Okay, so Dasarat, he was the king of Ayodhya. Ayodhya was a very luxurious and very opulent city, 24 miles 
across 96 miles long. There were million, hundreds of millions of citizens in, in the city and everyone was uh, qualified in the four varnas. The four varnas were there. The city was beautiful. Elephants would roam the city, sprinkling scented water along the walkways. Houses were decorated with various types of festoons, uh, fruits, and various flags. Everything was, it was, it actually rivaled uh, enters the boat in the, in the heavenly planets. It was so opulent. And there were, uh, there were no, there was no sinful people. Everything was according to uh, the principles of morality, civility, and spirituality. The city was well guarded by some of the greatest Kshatriya fighters in the history of the, at that time. Uh, you can read, you know, take some time and read in a very elaborate way, the glory of the city. Um, but Dasarat was unhappy. Although he had everything, he had prestige, he had power, he had followers, he had uh, many qualified and beautiful wives. He had everything, citizens, wealth, but still he wasn't happy because as hard as he had endeavored, he was not able to create the heir to his throne. He did have one daughter, her name was Shanta, and he gave that daughter to his neighboring friend, Romapad, who had a kingdom there, the king, the kingdom of Anga, Romapad's Maharaj was the uh, ruling head, and so he gave Shanta, his daughter, to him because Romapad also had no issue at all. So, but Dasarat wanted a son, and he was getting old. And so he was thinking, I should perform a yagya. I should perform an asphalmeda yagya. And this will bring auspiciousness. And if the gods are pleased by this, they'll bless me with a son. So he consulted his ministers, which is the duty of a ruling monarch, is to get advice from a class of people who are known as advisors. They are the Brahmins. The Brahmins give advice and direction, counsel to the Kshatriya rulers, the kings. And this way, everyone has their role in society. <laughs> and this way, the Kshatriyas, they get the best advice on how to rule the kingdom. And so he took permission from them and they granted it immediately saying, yes, King, this is a good idea. But then uh, when everything was being ready, there, Sumantra came to, came to uh, uh, Dasrat and said, uh, in order for this to be successful, you have to bring Rishi Shringa and his wife, Shanta, who is your which was who was your daughter? They are now living in the kingdom of Ma, uh, of Romapad, and Rishi Shringa is very powerful. When Maharaj Romapad was undergoing in his area of the world very severe drought, uh, he arranged for his daughter to marry Rishi Shringa, who was living in the forest as a hermit. But he was so powerful with Rishi Shringa that simply by coming into the kingdom. Indra immediately started to pour rain, very auspicious. It's interesting, you know, when there's too much sinful activity, there's always, uh, there's always calamities on all levels, even in the weather, there's inclement weather, droughts, famine, pestilence, which we know of, uh, forest fires, uh, uh, tidal waves, hurricanes, all of these are due, all of these uprisings of Mother Nature are due to the sinful life of the population. Uh, if you were to uh, do a little research, and you can do it, 
today you can find it. There are so many uh, what we call cataclysms going on in the world in different areas of the world because today people are sinful. There's no question about it. They don't follow any rules and regulations. They do whatever they want, whatever they want. And uh, they think that this is the way to live life. And therefore, they break religious principles, they break moral principles, and therefore they get reactions which expand itself out to affect the entire society, especially the killing of cows. When cows are killed, the whole society goes to hell in a systematic way. And so, um, Sumantra's advice was taken by Dasarat. And he spoke to his friend, Romapad, and Romapad said, yes, yeah, you, your, your daughter and your son-in-law can come. And so he gave permission and they came to the kingdom. And because of the presence and the sacrifice of the quality of sacrifice issued by uh, uh, Vishwashringa, you yeah, know, out of the fire, this was called Putresti. Putresti was the ceremony that was performed. And out of the fire, uh, a golden person came holding a pot in his hand. When he placed that pot, he handed it to Dasarat and then went back into the fire. It was a mystical being who brought about what is called, what we know is called as Havasyana which is just a, a sacred type of sweet rice. And it's given, it was, it was instructed by, uh, by the yogi masters that you give these to your three queens. And after some time, they will start to develop, you know, pregnancy. And so he took it and it was instructed how he should do it. He took half and gave it to Koshalya. He took the other half and he took, uh, he divided that into half again and he gave one, one quarter to, um, to, uh, to Mitra and he gave one eighth. No, he gave one eighth to Sumitra and one quarter to Kekaya. That's right, Kekai. And then he took that other eighth and gave it to Sumitra. So Sumitra had two children, Lakshman and Satrugna. Kekaya had Bart, Ushaya had Ram. And after some time, four illustrious, powerful personalities came. They were the incarnations of Lord Narayan who manifested themselves as Vasudev. Sankarsana, Anirudhya, and Prajuna say they are incarnations of the symbols of Lord Vishnu, the Kanch, the disc, the lotus, and the uh, um, chakra. So uh, four sons they grew up very nicely. They were they were loving amongst each other, but everyone could see that Ram was the most outstanding, and so his father. Of course, he was also coming from his principal queen. So his father designated him as the prince regent or the upcoming king, monarch, after he would retire. So Dasart wanted, wanted to retire before he died. And this is a very important principle we don't see in today's society, is that now when someone gets into office, they die in office. They can't even perform their duties properly, they get so old, and still they stay in office to the end, fag end of life. But here we see in the example is that one should retire timely, as it says, and Dasarat followed that principle and he was preparing to, you know, finish out his time while his son was ruling Ram the kingdom. But then there was some intrigue by Kaikei's uh, servant, Mantara. And Mantara, she turned the whole thing around and poisoned Kaikei, saying that Bart should be the king 
and uh, you should and the Bart's the king. Ram will become angry, and he'll he'll get his armies against Bart, and there'll be so much problem. So better to send Bart uh, Ram to the forest for fourteen years. And uh, Kaikei, he had the benediction that she could ask two baboons from uh, Dasra at any time she wanted to. She had saved his life, nursed, nurtured him back after he was injured, and uh, he gave her two blessings. And he, she said, I'll take those blessings when I need them. So Mantara told her, this is the time. Now, at first, Kaikei wasn't interested. But Mantar is uh, very poisonous mentality. It was persistent. And somehow she convinced Aikei, even against her will, that she could she'd go ahead with this plan. So she told Darsarat. Darsarat was mortified. He couldn't believe that she had done that. She had so much love for Ram even though she wasn't his direct mother still. Everyone loved Ram. <clears throat> he was the sinister. He was the, the pinnacle of everyone's ideal, the ideal person. He was powerful, loving, humble. Everything about him was so uh, attractive. Of course, he was the supreme personality of Godhead. But he manifested all of these qualities even at a young age. And uh, so when Dasarad heard that, he was besides himself with, with grief. And he had promised to give her the boons. And she threatened him that your reputation will be destroyed if you do not follow your promise, because it's understood that when the Kshatriya gives a promise, better to die than break the promise. Mm -hmm. It's also a very interesting point that we should understand. A lot of times we promise things to someone or something in some situation, and we don't follow through with it. Um, that is a sign of, of weakness. That is the sign of, of uh, um, not understanding uh, what it means to give you a word. Just like we find people who take initiation sometimes. After some time, they, they fail to vow, follow their initiation vows. <clears throat> then they go down in their spiritual life, and uh, <clears throat> they cause trouble to everyone, <clears throat> not only to themselves, to the spiritual master, but to everyone. Because <clears throat> on initiation, it's called a vow, not a promise. A promise sometimes can be... Uh, broken under circumstance, but a vow can never be broken no matter what. So he had the Kshatriyas take a vow of truthfulness. So he, when he gave that vow, uh, that promise that he was going to, it was a vow. And she threatened it to make his reputation destroyed. If she did. So he was at the hands of this these, these two ladies who had conspired against Ram to change the whole situation. Why did Mantara do that? Mantara did that because he was thinking if Ram becomes king and Koshalya will be the, the, the uh, what we call it, the ideal queen, the favored queen. Right now, Kaikei was the favored queen, but once Ram becomes the king, you know, that will be replaced by Koshalya. And so, and she was thinking, I'm the maidservant of Kaikei. Therefore, what will happen to me? What will happen to my situation? I will no longer get the benedictions that I'm receiving as being a maidservant of Kaikei. So she was greedy, envious, and very cunning. And this is also a, a very important part to understand that we should not listen to people speaking bad about others because it's poison. Even if it has some element of truth, it's never completely true, but if it ha even has some element of truth, it should be avoided because it disturbs the mind and causes one to commit offenses and causes one's spiritual life 
to be put on hold, check. So one should not listen to or even engage in criticism, fault finding, blasphemy of anyone, especially devotees. So we can see the effects here. Katie was interested, was innocent, but she lent a sympathetic ear at one point. And because of that, she became victimized by the poison. And although initially she had no uh, feelings of enmity towards Ram or any desire for her son to become the king, still, just by listening to this very cunning uh, vituperation by uh, Mantara, she changed. Mm -hmm. so it's a good lesson to learn that. Be careful what you listen to and who you listen to, now what you say and who you associate with. It can cause your spiritual life to be damaged very severely. <laughs> okay, there's so, so many wonderful stories of the life of Sri Ram. <laughs> uh, he spent 14 years in the forest, but it, going back a little bit, he. Uh, it's an interest, another interesting point about the quality of a dutiful son. It says that the uh, sub obedient to superiors is a quality of morality, and civility, and intelligence. So Ram, when he heard from his father, Dasarat, that the, oh, the whole situation was changed and Bart was going to be the king, and he was going to be to the forest, he immediately accepted it because it came from his father, who is his superior. He didn't argue, saying, well, you know, all the citizens are favoring me, and, you know, you already chose me. Now. He didn't argue. He was thinking, whatever my father says, I must obey. And he did it willingly. And then, of course, that led to him going to the forest, Another interesting point as precedes them going to the forest that uh, Lakshman immediately when he heard he wanted to join Ram and Lakshman and Ram agreed. But Sita, she also had that same desire. I cannot stay here in Ayodhya without you, Ram. The duty of a wife is to be with her husband. So I'm going. He said, you can't go. <laughs> he said, I'm going. The forest, he said, the forest is dark. It is, you know, full of rakshastra, dangerous persons. There are wild animals. There are dangerous insects. It's cold. What will you eat? Now, how will you live? It's not meant for a princess like you. He listened to Ram's admi admonishing. But then he said, my dear husband, for me, Iodia, without you, is like the forest. And the forest with you is like Iodia. He made that beautiful statement that doesn't matter where I am, if I'm with you, that's all it counts. And so she had that dedication and love for Ram. And though, therefore, Ram could not refuse her. But he, we see, as the story plays itself out, that there were so many problems with Sita in the forest. Fast forward a little bit. The demigods had asked Lord Brahma to arrange for the Supreme Lord to come because there was this powerful Rakshastra, his name was Ravana, who was uh, quite invincible. He had received benedictions from Lord Bhama himself that he could not be killed by any living entity except humans. He decided not to take that benediction because it's known that the Rakshastra race is much more superior than the human race both in intelligence and in abilities. So he was thinking, 
Don't even give me that benediction. It's an insult. So he took benedictions that he would not be killed from all any other species of life except humans. So the Lord incarnated into human. <laughs> to keep the benedictions of Lord Rama intact. And this Ravana, he was very, very powerful and very, very lusty. He was personification of lusty desires. He had so much wealth, so many followers, so much honor and prestige were coming his way. He had so many queens. He had one of the most chaste queens in the history of Vedic culture, Mandodari. He's glorified on the same level as Anasuya and Sita. And, but still, he wasn't satisfied. So this is a very important point that we should be careful notation of because it's very fundamental to our practice in Krishna consciousness. And what is that? Is that uh, uh, one can never be satisfied by material things. The more you have, the more you want. And the more you get, the less satisfied you become. But just the way it is, the soul is by nature pure and it gives satisfaction in relationship to the Lord. The mind and senses may get some temporary satisfaction from the external energy, but it cannot sustain it in a person where they get some pleasure, some satisfaction, some temporary permanence, and a temporary feelings of happiness, but then all of that is lost very quickly. And so it says that when you try to satisfy lust, it's compared to throwing a log on a, on a fire. As soon as you throw the log on the fire, the fire will go down uh, the presence of the log. And therefore, the fire becomes less. So the fire of lust goes down every time you try to satisfy it. But then again, because the, the log will blaze in a little while, that same lust will increase more and more. This example is used in the Bhagavad Gita by Krishna. So uh, it's a very important thing to understand. That we, we as spirit beings, we can only be satisfied with something that is of our nature. And that is Krishna consciousness, God consciousness, spiritual activities. Can ever be satisfied fully or completely with material things, material situations. Okay, and then of course, the story goes on uh, how Ravana uh, heard about Sita from one of his generals. Uh, and that and he came, played a trick on the Lord using Marichi to lure Ram away from Sita's protection. He stole her and took her to his capital in Lanka, uh, 800 miles across the ocean. And uh, the Lord didn't, acting as an ordinary human being, appeared to be, didn't know where his Sita was. And so he was told that if he wanted to find Sita, he should go to the, to the kingdom of the Varnas and get advice from Sugriva. And so he did, made alliances with the monkeys. Of course, there's many stories and and then the monkeys, with the with, along with Ram, there were millions and millions of varners. These were some of them were demigods who had taken the birth of this culture called varners, which were half monkey and half human. And uh, they uh, they uh, assisted Ram in helping to bring Sita back to Ram which is a beautiful story and how the fighting went on 
you read in the Ramayan, how uh, diligent uh, um, Ravana was in sending out his soldiers, his forces, his generals, some of his invincible uh, associates, but they were all destroyed by the arrows of Raman, Lakshman, and by the power of the monkey soldiers. It was a great battle. <laughs> uh, the last final battle between Ram and uh, Ravana is very interesting. They squared off and they were shooting arrows at each other. Of course, both were expert archers. And Ram was shooting and, you know, and Ravana, he had 10 heads. And so Ram was slicing off his heads with the, his arrows, but Ravana was not in the least bit uh, phased by that because every time one head would go off, it would grow back again. He had an unlimited nectar of immortality that was situated within his heart. And therefore, the heads would come when they would be sliced off, they would come back. But then Bibishan, who was the brother of Ravana, who had defected from Ravana, he was a saintly person. He wasn't like the other Rakshashi. He said, if you want to kill him, you have to shoot it into his heart. There he has a reservoir of nectar. Uh, it's a very amazing and very intricate and complex story of how Ravana was, was to be killed. And, and then, of course, um, he had the Ram had been given an arrow by a very famous and very powerful sage named Augusta Muni when they were in. And uh, what was that place? Um, Panchali? Um, Panchavati. Yeah. When they were in Panchavati, he gave him a special arrow. He said, use this only when you actually need it. It's like a Brahmasta. So at that time, Ram remembered the arrow, went through his quiver, found that arrow, put it back on his bow, pulled it back. And as soon as he pulled it back, the entire universe started to shake. And aquatics were jumping in the waters. Animals were falling out of the, birds were falling out of the sky. It was um, just by him pulling it back. And then he fired that arrow with such force and went into the heart of Ravana and came out to the other side and went into the earth, went around the earth and came back into uh, uh, Ram's quiver. Powerful arrow. So it's another very important message that we have here is that with the mercy of Guru, Agastya Muni, one can achieve you know, success in one's practice of spiritual life. <clears throat> Without the mercy of Guru, Guru, one cannot actually achieve any advancement on the practice, practice of devotional service. On Yasya Prashada, Bhagavad Prashada, Yasya Prashada, Nagati Kutopi. Only by the mercy of Guru can one traverse the path of bhakti, and by the mercy of Guru, one can reach the, the platform of perfection, which is Prema Pumartha Mahan, pure love for Krishna, which is the, the ultimate goal of human life. And the most prized and rare situation where the living entity can go back home, back to the spiritual world, in their eternal home, and associate with the Lord in loving devotion and service. And so this is just, we're just touching a small, tiny drop of a drop of this most amazing story. Uh, please take some time today and read as much as you can. I'll end with one very interesting pastime that you probably haven't heard. Most people haven't heard this pastime. Um, 
it's related to a question that sometimes comes up that remains unanswered. But I came across the answer just recently. Uh, how did Ram and his others leave the planet? We know when Sita was banished from the kingdom, Lakshman took her to the to the uh, ashram of Valmiki Muni, and there, she, at that time, she was pregnant, and she gave birth to two illustrious sons, Love and Kush. And then she left the world while being at Valmiki's ashram. So how did Ram leave? It's interesting. After all of his pastimes, somewhat fleet, Lord Brahma came to Ram and said, it is now time to return to your abode. Ram listened. And then just a little bit after that, a particular person came. His name was Time. Time took the form of an, a mendicant, an older person. And he appeared in the life of Ram. He said, Ram, I am time. I've come with a message. And this message cannot be heard by anyone but you. So let us have a secret meeting. And I will explain this message to you. Ram readily agreed, knowing it was coming from Lord Brahma. And so they arranged for a meeting and said that anybody who hears this message outside of Ram would immediately die. So in order to prevent that, the meeting was secret. And so uh, they came together and then Ram stations Lakshman outside and says, if anybody comes, don't let them in, don't interrupt this meeting. And anyone, and if anyone who interrupts this meeting will be punished. So, Tom and Ty together, and then Darvasa Muni comes. We know Darvasa Muni, he's very, well, when he wants something, he makes sure he gets it. But he tries his best. He can't say no to the Rasa Muni. He doesn't listen to anything. So he came and said, he came up to Lakshman. He said, there is to meet him. I have to talk to him right away. Lakshman said, he's busy. He cannot talk right now. You'll have to wait to his finish. I want to see him now. And if I don't get, if you don't allow me to see him now, I'll burn this whole city of Ayodhya to the ground. So he threatened. The Lakshman thought, all right. They went inside and said, Dervasa Muni is here to see you, my dear Lord. And uh, the Lord was very much angry that he got, the meeting was interrupted. But Knowing Durvasa, uh, Ram said to Lakshman, send him in. So he came in and the meeting was, the time was curtailed and Ram met with Durvasa Muni for some time. After that was all over, Ram came to Lakshman and said, you didn't follow my instructions to allow, not to allow anyone in. Therefore, I don't want to see you again. You cannot stay in my association. Lakshman was brokenhearted by that, but he took it as an opportunity. And so immediately after that, he went down to the, to the ocean and he walked right into the ocean and left the world. So in one sense, it was the occasion that allowed Lakshman to return to the spiritual world. Now, Ram gathers his two brothers, Bart and Satrugna, and he says, now we are leaving. 
So the three of them start walking, and everyone in the citizens in the valley were worried. Where are they going? And then it was understood that Ram was going to the road, going to the forest. Yes, he was going to go to the forest. So he was thinking he's going to the forest again. How can we, you know, undergo this separation that is miserable? He was gone for 14 years. Now he's leaving again. So they got their wagons, they got their bullock carts, they got all of their paraphernalia together. And not only the citizens, but even the animals could not withstand the Ram. And so there was a grand exodus of the entire city. It said there was nothing left in the city. No life was found anywhere in the city. Everyone was following Ram into the forest again. Ram walked for some time. He came to this body of wood called the Sarayu River. We also know that Ayodhya is right there by that famous Sarayu River. He stood. Ram kept walking straight ahead with his mind fixed on what he was doing. He was not deterred by all of the citizens that were following him. The three of them walked and came to the Sarayu River with folded hands. They offered prayers to the Sarayu River and the three of them walked into the river and that was the disappearance of Ram, Bart, and Satruga, Satrugna. Lakshman and Sita had already, already achieved the spiritual world. That's a beautiful story. How the Lord performs his pastimes of disappearance. When he appears, it's glorious. When his dis he disappears, it's, it's a very sad occasion for everyone but it's to be expected because he comes for a certain time, performs his mission, and because he is the independent supreme personality of Godhead, according to his own desires, he leaves whenever he wants. He's not bound by anything. Of course, he's bound by the love of his devotee, but all it says that all of those citizens and the animals, they also went all, they all went back to Godhead. Well, that was no loss for the citizens. Perfection in life and liberation back. Nina, are you there? Yes. Yes, 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 Maharaj. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing those wonderful stories, especially this, uh, the last pastime. You know, Maharaj, we've been hearing um, about the glories of Sri Lord Ram for the last few days. And today is the beautiful day, and this anticipation has been building up so much for for Ram Namavi. Thank you so much for giving us the beautiful story. Maharaj, one quick question: um, You were talking about uh, Lord Ram and his uh, and his brothers leaving this earth. Um, I was thinking of Mother Sita. If you could kindly enlighten and give a little bit more significance about how we should understand about Mother Sita going back to Mother Earth. I, we, we see that when she had the Agni Pariksha, I mean, she was not, Lord Ram had to actually exchange the real Sita back from the fire god. But how should we understand that Mother Sita once again in front of everybody, uh, how she felt or how should we understand that she went back to Mother Earth? How should we see that? Well, I think it's the, it was the will of Ram, and so she followed that. It was his, it was his invulnerable will. He wasn't going to change that. But it was all orchestrated for their exodus back to the spiritual world. When he tested her with the, 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 uh, with the, with the test of fire, she fixed her mind 
on the lotus feet of Ram and walked into the fire. And then the fire god came out with the real Sita. So uh, the, that pastime shows that Ravana, and this is a general principle or a, uh, a, a rule that uh, a great personality cannot be touched by the envious demons who exist. They have no jurisdiction to do anything to them. Demons cannot capture or harm persons who are spiritually pure. It's not possible. That's why Prabhupada would even say Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. <laughs> he simply went into samadhi. He was not killed. He went into a samadhi and he would he feigned the idea of, of dying. And then they put him into that, that cave. And after three days he came out. And it's described that he went to an area of India called uh, what was that area? Uh, the India, the area of northern India. What is Kashmir? It? Yeah, Kashmir. Mm. Christ went to Kashmir. There's a lot of proof that he left the world when he was in Kashmir. A lot of evidence. So just to just to illustrate that a great soul can never be killed or touched by the demon, demoniac person. Pure devotees can never be harmed. But it looks sometimes it appears that way. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, one quick question. You were, you were, I was pondering on the thing of vow and promises that you were saying. We see so many people taking vows, coming into his con and getting initiated. However, after a while, they either are not able to follow the regulative principle very, very sternly. So what happens? Does it come back to them as a karma? Or? Yeah, they go down. They go down. If they fail to chant their rounds, they go down. If they break the regulative principles, then they cause problems with their spiritual master. Spiritual master gets sick or has bad dreams. <clears throat> Prabhupada talks about that. So, yeah, there's a reaction for that because that that vow is taken in front of the fire, which represents the Lord. You assemble the uh, Vaishnavas, spiritual master, or the specific succession. It's such an auspicious ceremony. <clears throat> that heralds the beginning of one's success in life. Initiation means beginning. As Prabhupada said, what are you beginning? You're beginning the path of bhakti. This is something that you've been waiting for for millions of lifetimes. So once you undergo it, <laughs> you should be taken very seriously. I think mean, Prabhupada spoke very strongly of about people who break it. I won't repeat some of the words because they're really kind of heavy. I don't want to scare people too much. <laughs> but one should not, you know, once if you if you take initiation, no question of not following. Mm. And probably say, well, if you're not going to follow, then why did you take initiation? Okay. True. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, we have Shukakara Prabhuji. Would you like to go ahead with your question? Mataji, thank you very much, Nina Mataji. Happy Ramalami. Uh, thank you very much, Chandramani uh, Maharaj. You are, you are actually, when we see you, we are seeing Sala Prabhupada. On this great day, you have come. So please, we seek all your blessings. Maharaj, I got one question. See, when uh, Ravana came to kidnap uh, Sita Devi, uh, actually she converted into Maya Sita because Ravana cannot come near the main Sita. But when Hanumanji came and met Sita Devi, at the time, Hanumanji revealed some very, very 
important thing which happened only Ram and Sita Devi knows. And also Sita Devi comes, told some stories which only Sita and Ram knows. So at that time, whether the Sita again got changed into the main Sita, how? Because she has already gone in the fire. So how <laughs> it can come back, so I'm going to be convinced. <laughs> And don't worry on the spiritual platform and everything's possible. <laughs> if you're looking for a practical answer, it, you know, it, it defies practical, practicality. Hmm. Yeah, because the, the relationship between the Lord and his internal energy has nothing to do with anything material. So it can keep changing automatically. Whenever required, it can change into normal sita, maya sita, maya sita, normal sita. Yeah. Yeah. The maya sita with Vegavati was actually a person. Vegavati had approached uh, Ram for marriage. He said, uh, you know, Ekaputni. But he promised her that he would marry her in another life, I think it was. I think in another incarnation she appeared and got the opportunity. But yeah, so she was a shadow represent yeah. mm -hmm. Can you just tell something about this Sundar Kandan because the Anuman and we want we didn't hear much about Hanumanji because the Sundarakan name came because uh, it was because of Hanuman was the hero at that point, not Sundarakandam. So Sundara means beautiful. So as a monkey, he was beautiful because his mother used to call him in the younger days, Sundara, Sundara, like that he used to call. So there I wanted some uh, little confirmation from me, Maharaj. What is, what is the what is the question? No, there is Balakand, Sundarakand, then Yudhakand. So Sundarakand actually it is uh, uh, totally played by Hanumanji after he jumped and went to Ashwakwati and he served, then finally he burned and came back. So Sundarakand, Sundara means beautiful. So it was Hanumanji, he was the main person. So how he was called Sundara just because his mother called him Sundara or he was Sundara as a devotee, that I want. <laughs> I think if you see him, you will understand your answer. <laughs> he is Lord Shiva only. <laughs> yeah, he's an energy of Lord Shiva, that's right. Keshavi Raj, Keshavi Putra. Anjana was a beautiful society girl. <laughs> Not society girl, she was a beautiful heavenly damsel, not a society girl. Yeah. So yeah, he comes from a very highly beautiful family. But does that does that indicate Hanuman when you say Sundara Khan? Does it does it connect direct with him? Or does it have another meaning to it? Because I heard in Kam Kambaramayanam. In there, they told that Sundarakandam is mainly, they are referring Hanumanji as Sundara. So I just want to know that he was Sundara, okay, he was beautiful, but he was not in the human body, of the monkey body, but still he was a beautiful servant of Lord Rama. And uh, yeah, is, is he in the, the Dasya, is he at the top or is what Lakshman? Lakshman was also by the Dasya and Hanumanji was also Dasya. So whom it really shows who is the Dasya is? Was Hanuman the biggest Dasa or Lakshmana? Well, it mentions in the Shastras that there are nine Angas of Bhakti. And one is, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, uh, becoming the servant of the Lord. That means bringing out and carrying out instruction. Hanuman is illustrated as the topmost in that area. You see, Lakshman. He carried out the orders, but sometimes reluctantly. <laughs> but I would just mention one thing. The word Sundara doesn't necessarily have to apply to physical beauty. Oh. Okay, Violence. 
one can have beautiful activities also. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Seek your blessings on Ram and Naomi. All of us should become a beautiful devotee at the end of Sri Ramachandra and uh, seek your blessings, profuse blessings, because you are really so close to Prabhupada. You are still alive and you are Prabhupada's disciple. So please bless all of us, Maharaj. Please. We you touch your lotus feet through Thank the online. Thank you for your very uh, insightful contributions to the philosophical discussions that we have. Thank you. They're always very interesting and very uh, revealing. <laughs> all, all your mercy, Maharaj, all your blessings. Thank you so much. Please, Holiness, Chandramali Maharaj, Ki Jai Maharaj. Thank you. Jyoti Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, please? Yes, Mataji. Thank you. Hare Krishna, then with pranam to you. Hare Krishna, then with pranam, Maharajji. Uh, Maharajji, my question is, uh, <laughs> why Lord always uh, start his life with crisis when he came in the yeah. in the <laughs> uh, when he was in the uh, Ram form. Uh, his whole life, entire life was full of crisis. When he came in the form of Krishna, he the crisis increased. So, and now the crisis that I'm facing in my current life, so it is very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I, I want to know why the crisis, why so many crises at the same time and why he designed so and what is the message? Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Dugalayam Masasratam. <laughs> this world is what it is, crisis. <laughs> Living in the material world means solving problems every minute. <laughs> Trying to solve problems. You're hungry, that's a problem. You're needy, that's a problem. You're cold, that's a problem. You're hot, that's a problem. Your neighbor's not right, that's a problem. Your money's not enough, that's a problem. Your body's giving you trouble, that's a problem. So many. Welcome to the material world. So all the time is consumed, Maharajji, and uh, how to gain that uh, the same spontaneity and the energy to do bhakti. I'm facing yeah. a lot of... Yeah, then the answer is there. Palo doshani deira janasti eko mahakun kirtana eva krishna siya mukta sangam param bhaja Christian Hare Krishna. But don't stop. <laughs> Keep chanting the holy names of the Lord and you'll push back all of the problems and you'll start to awaken real happiness, which is the nature of the soul's existence. Want to be happy? Again, Hare Krishna. Serve Vaishnavas and take Krishna Prashad. And you'll be happy. <laughs> Just do those three things. I'll try, Maharaji. I'll definitely try. I'm trying. But see, it is difficult. Even the three things which you said, it sounds very simple, but in the crisis, it's very difficult to follow. It's really very difficult. Well, yeah. Please accept respectful obeisances. But one of the qualities of a Vaishnava is not disturbed by happiness and distress. For Gita, not to be, happiness comes and goes. The stress comes, it goes. Oh, yeah. A devotee keeps their mind focused on their business, despite the happiness, despite the distress. Our business is to become Krishna conscious. Yes, I'll try, Maharaj Thank you so much. 
much now. Yeah. <laughs> That's so discouraged. Maharaj, one thing I've noticed, um, I, I haven't been like, I'm basically a kind of a new devotee, but when, we, when, I, when I started to chant a few years ago, things starts to fall in its place. So when devotees say chant and it will take you, it's like magic. It's unbelievable how things fall in its place just by chanting. It, it, it's, it's amazing. I mean... Center is the creator. Krishna created everything. He knows how yeah, everything. Absolutely. He's the source. He's the center. He's the energy. He's everything. And so you bring Krishna into your life, things start yeah. to be organized again. <laughs> <laughs> My only complaint to Lord Krishna, why didn't I know this before? <laughs> I mean, things would be so much simpler. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it took so long. Yeah, you should tell it to all of your associates that don't waste time because yes. I waste time. Yes, yes, yes. Devotees, mm -hmm. please switch on your camera so Maharaj can view you all and he can bless you all. Please. Um, I saw another hand raised. Okay. Scarlet Mataji, do you have a question for Maharaj? I'm so sorry. It, it, can, it, can, it can wait for ne next time. I'm That's not, okay. So I will take, do it next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sri Devi Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, please? Thank you, Nina. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to beautiful Lord Ram in these beautiful pastimes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Guru Maharaj, right in the beginning, you mentioned about the initiation vows and how serious it is to keep our vows. And you said that when you break your vows, it causes disturbance to you and to others. Then later on, I think to Nina's question, maybe you explain that when you stop chanting, you start getting reaction, but you break the regulator principle, the spiritual master starts suffering. So how is it that others start, uh, you know, getting uh, disturbed also by this, uh, you're breaking the vows? I, it, I thought it's just the disciple and the spiritual master who suffer, but it sounded like it disturbs others also. Yeah, because yeah. you're connected to other people. You're not an island in yourself. Right. And if, you're, if you're Krishna conscious, wherever you are, go, you benedict people. If you're material conscious, then you, you affect people in that way. If you give up your vows, that means who's going to trust you in the, in the future? You lose, you break trust. When you break trust on that level, then you're, you know, that means you can't, you can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. well, as I mentioned that in a, about a month ago, three things that make up human qualities. One is to, one is to keep your promise Keep your word. That's one of the qualities of a human being. That when they're going to do something, they're going to say they're going to do it. They do it. Now, extenuating circumstances allow things to adjust. But when it comes to a vow, you have to understand the difference between a promise vow. A vow is something that is not breakable. A promise is adjustable due to circumstance, but we still shouldn't take advantage of it. Hmm. So when we break our vows, we are going to definitely get affected by the material energy. And as we become polluted by the material energy, we are going to cause disturbance to other people since we are connected to other people. Yeah. Just like marriage, they say take your marriage vows also. So marriage is another terminology they use the word vow in it also. Marriage vows, initiation vows, 
what other what other category implies the word vow in it? And I think those two are the only two I can think of. Thank you, Maharaj. Shyamgari Mataji, would you like to go ahead, Mata, with your question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Happy Ram Nami. Um, thank you so much. Very, very wonderful katha. Nice to hear from you on the day of Ram Nami. So, Maharaj, um, my question is like, you know, Sita Devi, she was uh, in the means uh, when before going to Ravan, she Lord Ram, uh, you know, um, transfer her in like, you know, Maya Sita and real Sita. So, where she went, you know, when um, they, did she went yeah. with Agni yeah. or did she went somewhere? Whose custody when, she was in? She was under the, she went to the boat of the fire god, Agni. Can you say it again, Maharaj? I couldn't hear. Yes, he went to the boat of fire god. Fire god. Okay. Namrata Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, Martha? Hare Krishna, I take some my humble obeisances, all glories to Shri Prabhupada. So, Maharaj, I wanted to ask about chastity. Uh, most of the time we hear uh, about chastity. Uh, I'm sure chastity is not limited to uh, being loyal, just being loyal to uh, one's own uh, spouse. There are much more uh, details in that. So um, can you please share, uh, shed some light on the topic of chastity? Oh, no, no, I'm not going to take. I'm not going to tackle that. It's too, it's too, it's too complex and it's too broad. Whatever I say is going to leave questions open. You're going to ask, you're going to get ten more questions for whatever I say. Yeah, I can give it from one angle of vision, and that's all I can say. But then again, you want. To, I don't want to turn it into a debate because we want to keep it on Ram Leela here. So uh, you can ask me another time. <laughs> okay, Maharaj, no problem. Hare Krishna. It's too complex and it's too broad. I understand, Maharaj. No yeah. problem. Okay. Shukha Kara Prabhu, would you like to go ahead with your question, please? Because I ask so many questions, please don't feel bad, Maharaj. I'm asking so many questions because I get immediate quick answer. You give one, one by one line reply. Uh, Maharaj is uh, Indra's son uh, who came as a crow and he disturbed Sita Devi and uh, uh, Ram, uh, Sri Ram sent the Brahmastra and as a Jayanta. So, in spite of hurting Sita Devi, uh, he went back to Sita Devi for support. And she told, please, uh, don't deserve, don't punish him, leave him. So she's so karuna that uh, Ram got annoyed because he has disturbed her. And when he went to her, and then he, then uh, Ram said, I have to uh, give some punishment so one eye will go. So Indra son lost one eye. And then he wrote, he gave Katha on Ramayana. So how the mercy is so much that somebody who is Playing against the Supreme Lord and the uh, the God, the wife of the Supreme Lord, and he is being blessed. And uh, there was one Ramayana of Jain Ramayana. So I'm just asking the the uh, the mercy or the Karuna of Sita Devi and Rama. I think you answered your question already. <laughs> well, the answer is the, the the mercy of the Lord. 
It's the next. <laughs> Why is the Lord merciful? Because he is. <laughs> No, no, just now you told us that Mahalaj, that anybody doing breaking the regulated principles. So the, all the people are breaking, they are also children. They are by mistake, they're doing some some they breaking the mistake. So will it get uh, excused by Guru and Gauranga or what is the way to get out of that? Because one of my uh, friend devotee, he he was a very good devotee, initiated, but somehow something happened in his life and um, he was trying to marry somebody she didn't marry so he started drinking so I'm telling you are, you already broken this again you are drinking you know, let me just get back to my give me some time I'll come back so uh, what is the solution for the mind being swayed away instead of promising in front of the fire god doing wrong things what can be the way to get corrected and you know come back to the spiritual life and Krishna consciousness well, obviously, they need some counseling and some help. Well, we have we we deal with the situation, but we know just simply by saying "come back," it doesn't really resonate with people. Uh, using threats doesn't work either because people just don't take them. Um, so you have to extend yourself to see if there is an opportunity to uh, reach the person and speak directly and try to understand deeper how what causes them to leave and what can what can come back you know? sometimes it's a something in their life sometimes they just weren't ready for initiation. They didn't under, under, understood what initiation mean. They didn't know, understand what spiritual life meant. They thought it was, you know, I'll join the club, get a name, and I'll be, you know, a nice spiritual person. <laughs> but it's not like that. So there's different reasons why people come, different reasons why people leave. Too. So the more serious ones, you have to take time and discuss it with them. Because since you are part of the top line of GBCs and all, I was just thinking that there are a lot of devotees, they are not getting proper care and you know, uh, there are new devotees joining, the money is coming, everything is coming, but the devotee care is not, uh, I'm not finding fault, Maharaj, I'm just telling you as you are like my father or your yeah. uncle. Uh, how, yeah, yeah. how how it can be extended? Well, they, we, we started a devotee care program starting in the end of the 1990s and it started to really blossom in the beginning of 2000, 2004 was at its best. And it's still in place. So it's a principle that has to be adopted in all of the centers that we, it's not that the guru just cares for the disciple. It has to be a care system where the disciple, yeah. whatever they need, even outside of the guru, within the yeah. uh, within the temple, within the association of the devotees. Yes, Maharaj, because this is a very important thing that is happening. So since you are very senior, I just wanted to share with you that uh, it needs more people. Yeah, if you study uh, the system that is being done by the devotees in Bombay, Chalpati, you'll ah. find it's a complete system. So anything anyone needs on any level, both in getting things or in uh, doing things or in uh, personal needs, you know, all of that is, is in a system where they have someone they can go to and okay. find answers to their problems. If you study okay, thank you, that that system started by Radhana Swami was ideal yeah. that back in the 1980s. Yeah. And it finally caught on. And other there's a few other yatras that have adopted it. But it's foolproof. In, in that uh, system in in child party because I've been I have personal experiences in that system so I know 
for sure how it works. Jay. So it's quite good. So, so uh, what is the source? How to go to the Chopati? I'm not in big touch with them. Can I go through you? Whether you can connect because to solve some serious problem going on in some uh, devotees and they are very scared and you know, they just trying to solve themselves and but they are not. They are getting more trouble and they are going away. I would suggest you call, contact this one devotee named Goranga. Mm -hmm. uh, He's one of the top devotees in Yatra. Go on the Nikovil. Go on the Nikovil Yeah. Yeah, but he's now a GBC for that area of oh, Goranga. Okay. Okay, okay, my lads. Thank you so much, my well lads. Knows this. Okay, my lads. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for your wonderful connectivity. Pramiti Mataji, please go ahead with your question, Mata. Uh, Dandavat Pranam Maharaj. Uh, uh, Maharaj, um, I am praying for your mercy to be initiated. Praying for mercy to get initiated? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Best wishes. Everyone should take that step in life. It's important. Because without that, one cannot achieve perfection in life or ultimate happiness. So um, prepare yourself. Follow the principles carefully. Chant your rounds nicely every day. Uh, associate with devotees and and then in due course of time, you'll uh, be qualified for that step called Bhajana Kriya. It's the third step on the eight step process, nine step process of Bhakti. Bhajana Kriya. So as you prepare yourself, Krishna will arrange everything for you. Mm. He'll do it. Haribol Mataji. Okay. And as, as the scriptures say, when a candidate is ready, the guru appears. <laughs> True. <laughs> Gail Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, please? Yes, thank you, Mataji. Hi, Krishna um, Maharaj. Yeah, my question, my question refers to the fact that um, when the disciple does not obey the orders of the spiritual master, the spiritual master suffers. So um, I'm just wondering about that because, you know, the spiritual master you know, he's usually Krishna's pure devotee who has taken the disciple out of his compassion and out of his desire to serve the Lord. So I just don't understand why Krishna would punish the spiritual master because of the misdeeds of his disciple who the guru was only trying to help yeah you know yeah. and 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 he is krishna's loving servant so yeah. it doesn't seem the answer logical is, yeah the answer is at the time of initiation there's a vow being made where the disciple vows to chant 16 rounds and follow strictly the four regular principles. And the spiritual master has vowed that to take that the disciple back to back to Godhead. So that's a contract. And now if the disciple doesn't follow the instructions, that's one thing. But if he if he breaks those four regulative principles, they are sinful activities. So the reactions of the sinful activities go both to the disciple and to the spiritual master, because the spiritual master has to has promised to take that person back to Godhead. Now, if the spiritual master does not correct that person, then 
he can also go down. So it's his duty to correct that person. And if that person cannot be corrected, then after one, some time, they can no longer call themselves a disciple and the contract is broken by the disciple. And therefore, there is no, no, no responsibility on the part of the spiritual master anymore. So it's only those four regulative principles we're talking about because they're sinful activities. That's the four. Well, if the disciple doesn't follow the instructions, he suffers. The spiritual master doesn't suffer. So, yeah, so, four so in, in the case where, um, you know, the, the disciple has not been following the, the four regulative principles, but you know, the, 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 there is no fault on the spiritual master because, you know, it's not that he hasn't taken him under his wing and given him good instruction. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink. So if in, in the situation where this, the disciple has not followed the good instruction of the spiritual master, you know, I don't know, it just doesn't seem... Yeah, I understand your question. I mm. understand clearly. And therefore, there's another injunction that says if a spiritual master carries a sinful disciple, he goes to hell also. So he has to drop that disciple or correct him. If he doesn't, can't correct him, he should drop him. <laughs> But then again, mm -hmm. you'll see that it's very rare that the spiritual master will drop a disciple, but it does happen. One thing I've also heard is that um, even if Krishna gives some reaction to the spiritual master, because the spiritual master is on a different platform, you know, he's on a spiritual platform, um, he doesn't experience the reactions the same way as an right. ordinary conditioned soul would. So exactly. maybe in that way, I can understand that he doesn't actually get like he gets a, a token. Mm -hmm. token. Hmm. It's a token. This probably said. Because you're committing sinful activities, I'm having bad dreams. You can read it in the, in the Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. But even that token, he probably wouldn't experience it the same way as an ordinary conditioned soul would, right? No, because Krishna minimizes that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if... <laughs> If we were to experience it on the same level as the severity of the of the breaking, then there'll be no spiritual masters left. <laughs> <laughs> they would it would all be you know, like you know, invalids. <laughs> but you know, you you in your answer you made a distinction between I wasn't sure what you were making the distinction between when you mentioned that. Breaking the four regs is sinful. And I think you were trying to distinguish that from some other kind of some other kind of um, misdeeds. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm following instructions, the disciples suffer. But these four sinful activities are the pillars of all sinful activities. Therefore, if one follows them, they're free from all reactions of all sinful activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is the part I'm trying to understand. So are you are you making a distinction between following the four breaking the four regs and not following instructions? No, yeah. because yeah, I am. Oh, not following Be instructions, the spiritual master doesn't suffer. But he suffers like a father who suffers when the child doesn't obey. That's the kind of suffering he goes through. 
because the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, following the four regs, that's also one of the instructions. Yeah, but that's specific. But that's what? That's specific at the time of uh, Oh, the voice is breaking. That's part of the fire yoga. You agree? Yeah. Those you can't break. So when you distinguish break the four regs from following the instructions, it means that following the instructions means specific things that the spiritual master asks you to do, whereas the four regs is in a different category. Like, like, the, like the spiritual master gives you the chance to turn around. And if you don't do it, you suffer, not him. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Maharaj, on the chat box, there are a few devotees that are requesting for your email. Can we go ahead and share it or no? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj doesn't want to be bombarded. <laughs> okay. If you, if, you can, if you can get it to the, uh, to the underground, then that's okay, but I'm not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. I I see a hand raised, but I don't see your name, Mataji. I just see your iPhone. Would you like to go ahead and pose your question? That's e Elena. Elena. Elena Mataji. Oh, Elena Mataji was uh, very happy to hear you laugh. She was uh, wonderfully mentioning a comment, Maharaj. It's so nice to hear you laugh. Go ahead, Hare Mataji. Krishna. With your question. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Go all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Guru Maharaj, and all glories to Devot. Um, I have a question. Uh, sorry for my bad English. Um, I have a question for initiation and uh, the merciful of uh, Guru. Because uh, in my situation, I think uh, I'm not a perfect, but uh, um, uh, when uh, uh, manif when uh, Krishna manifests the um, the, the disciples, it's uh, okay to initiation because um, uh, I respect the principle uh, chanting uh, 16 rounds or um, uh, the, the principle, no? Uh, don't eat uh, meat and, okay. But uh, I'm not perfect to do this. And uh, when, when? Uh, I, think I, um, your, I, think, I think I know the answer to your question. The answer so I think yeah let me let me tell you the answer it's not so simple if anyone wants to get initiation they say well I want to aspire for this spiritual master so as soon as they begin aspiring they, they become officially connected with the process of following the instructions of the spiritual master and then for at least one year they have to chant 16 rounds every day and follow the four regular principles. And then before they can get initiated, they have to take the disciples course, which is a yes. two day. And they also have to get an approval from their mentor, their local authority who they work under in order for the spiritual master to go ahead and give initiation. So the spiritual master really doesn't get involved with the initiation process. He just gives the initiation. The process is, is documented in a certain way by different uh, rules and requirements that are given. So one has to follow and come up to the standard. That's it. So you have to know what are those 
what are those rules and requirements that I have to follow in order to qualify for initiation. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's it. And then once you follow all of them and you get an approval, just like those who live in the United Kingdom, in the area of England, very strict system. Mm -hmm. They have people, before you can get initiated, you go to that system and they put you under the care of a senior devotee. And then you have to, you have to be responsible to that senior devotee who monitors your progress in spiritual life. And after you pass all of the requirements, the senior devotee will say, well, this person is ready for initiation. They'll write a letter. The letter will go to the spiritual master saying this person is now ready for initiation. So it's a process. Yes. So you just you have to plug into that system. That's all. And each, each guru has a system. How he, uh, how he mandates his approval, and there is a system you have to follow. That's all. So, in my case, there is a person. Her name is Radha Bhakti, and if you can she's this. She does my secretarial work. If you contact her, she'll give you all the information in written form, plus other things, and then you're on your way. <laughs> when Prabhupada was here, it wasn't like that. Prabhupada just observed somebody and gave him initiation right away. But now we have a system. And that system protects the disciple and protects the, and the spiritual message. And protect the guru, no? Yeah, the guru, the guru is protected, and the spirit and the disciple becomes qualified. Okay. We have to become qualified for initiation, not just oh, it's a nice thing to do, and so I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to graduate from college, you got to take the tests, go to the lectures, pass the examinations. Do the homework. Virtual <laughs> life is same thing. So, good luck. <laughs> I wish everyone good luck, but I don't do anything. I just sit back and wait for the recommendation letter that comes through. Very well. Thank, Thank you very much. I'll quickly read through some of the comments. So uh, Ayan Shah is um, expressing his heartfelt obeisances at your Lotus Feet Maharaj. We have Aditi Mataji wishing everybody happy Ram Navami and uh, obeisances at your Lotus Feet Maharaj. Jyoti Mataji is offering her humble obeisances at your Lotus Feet and um, Parimiti Mataji as well. Uh, and she thanks you for having such a wonderful glorification of Lord Rama's uh, pastimes and classes. Sri Devi Mataji um, mentions that your discourses are sondara, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Parimit Parimiti Mataji is seeking your blessings, your prayers. Um, Ria Mataji says such a wonderful uh, association that you are giving to all of us and she's thanking you. Jyoti Mataji is eternally grateful. And of course, Ileana Mataji, she was um, happy to hear you laugh. And then let me just quickly browse. And Gail Mataji, Mataji has one more question. Gail Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, Mata? Thank you, Mataji. Yes, Maharaj, I'm just curious about what to make of um, spiritual masters who who don't actually follow the process you described before um, initiating their disciples you know let's say those who require 
much, much less time than a year of, you know, and, and don't require either, you know, a, a letter from a temple, recommend, a recommendation letter, things like this, you know, what, to, what how should I, what's that, what to make of that? No, it's across the board. Now, you know, the idea is out. Before a person gets initiation, they have to get a recommendation. No, but I mean, I'm aware of several cases where, you know, initiation happens without those requirements being fulfilled. So what to, what to make of that? What can you do? <laughs> Okay, I mean, I, 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 I didn't know, you know, what, is, is there any implication for the spiritual master or the disciple or, I don't well, know. Well, the spiritual master wants someone who, 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 who is serious and these qualifications help to establish your commitment, your seriousness. But mm -hmm. it doesn't mean because you don't follow all the qualifications, you're not serious. But still, just like in a university, you have to go through the, the different requirements in order to get the diploma. So there have been too many, too many incidences where people have come for initiation and left. They, they were initiated and then they went away. In order to prevent that, this is what's required. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I guess, as you said, you know, there, there may be exceptions where the spiritual master bypasses some of those requirements and the student is also serious. Well, it depends on where it is. Like in the UK, the spiritual masters can't be there. Mm -hmm. They know that. If they have any disciples in the United Kingdom, they have to follow strictly that system. It's a, it's a very strong and very organized system. It's been going on for years. Yes. So, yeah, but sometimes outside of the UK or where the system is not so strongly in place, they may do something like that. But that's yes. up to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cases I'm thinking of, they are outside of UK. Yeah. Okay, Maharsh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How about... Sorry, Maharaj, go ahead. Do we stop here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll go ahead. Van Chakal Pataru Kesh, the pass in the bay, which a Padita now Baba named your Vaishnavi. The cultivation of the Kiche, Ventrashi Matu Kiche, Holy Swami Mahalaki Kiche.